Now, I want to show you a couple of um, excerpts from this film, Birth of a Nation. It's, a, it's, it's considered by cinemaphiles a classic of American movie making by D.W. Griffith because of its panoramas of Civil War battles and, and acting and other things. The acting is very stilted, you'll see, and of course it's a silent movie, but I'm just going to show you a few scenes about how this view of Reconstruction was translated to the screen. Here is a scene. This is the uncrowned king of Reconstruction is Thaddeus Stevens, or Stoneman in the movie. He's sitting there with, surrounded by members of Congress and others. This is where the power, by the way, this is a complete myth. Uh, Stevens did not control the Congress by any means. He, he was influential. Now, another point about Birth of a Nation, this is his uh, mixed race black mistress. You may remember from Spielberg's Lincoln, Thaddeus Stevens, Tommy Lee Jones goes home having stolen the 13th Amendment, that didn't happen, but, uh, and presents it to, in bed to the woman. They don't go quite that far here, but there she is. This is the black Southerner. He's, and the, by the way, all the quote-unquote black actors in this film are whites in blackface. No black actor could have been hired to be in a Hollywood movie at this moment. But anyway, this is just um, Stevens, the blacks, etc., and uh, the beginning of the horrible events of Reconstruction. Um, he comes in, uh, let's come into his, uh, right, she enters him in. So the, the, even, even these are Republican members of Congress, but they're going to be, even they're going to be alarmed when Stevens brings him in and says, this man is equal to you, etc. cetera. So um, in he goes. He's going to be one of the leaders of Southern Reconstruction, according to, according to the film. Anyway, um, we're going to go to another clip in a minute. Let's just see him come in. Here he goes. Don't scrape to me. You are the equal of any man here. Now, this is supposed to be the most horrible possible thought, that he's the equal of any man here, you see? All right, let's go to the next one. There's just a few little clips. This is, let's see what it is. We'll go to our... Ah, now he's in the South. Uh, now, this, now, this is short. Here come some black soldiers walking down the street, and they pushed the two whites off the sidewalk. You see how terrible things are now in the South. <laughs> this is just a sign of the indignities that are being perpetrated on white Southerners. The sidewalk walks, okay, Colonel Cameron. Of course, he's quite offended by this. All right, we'll go to another little clip. Uh, oh, here's the Union. Now, here he is, our Southern Black, the Union League. This is the mobilization of black voters. They're all gathered together. Uh, see, 40 Acres and a Mule is back there. Equal oh, you missed, on that sign saying equality, it'll come back again. It says some equal rights, equal marriage. See at the bottom? Equal politics, equal marriage. This is the horrible, the most horrible thought. Um, and... It's the crux of what the film will really be about, ultimately. But anyway, this is the secret meeting of the Union League um, with soldiers around. But at least this is 1915. People remembered that there had been black soldiers. That was part of the living memory. That fades out eventually. But this is the uh, political meeting, and uh, he's going to go in, and et cetera. So let's uh, go to the next one. This is the South Carolina legislature with a footnote on the movie, historical facsimile, etc. And this is a picture of the degradation of democracy, as you will see. Good movie making right there. So this is what happens when black people are put into positions of historic incidents. This is not film. This is history. 
This guy's eating his chicken in there and it's being told he's not supposed to do that. He's got his liquor, see? Taking off his shoes. So you see that this is a travesty of legislative, uh, you know, environment. <laughs> now this is all, you know, harmless in a sense, but we begin in a minute to see the real danger which, uh, will, uh, which will emerge out of this. Not quite yet, all whites must salute Negro officers on the streets. The whites, you'll see, are all sitting there very, dig they're all dignified, they're, they're powerless, but they're not out of control like the blacks are. White visitors come into the gallery. And here we will see, he sees the white woman up there. And this will later become the crux of the movie because the Ku Klux Klan arises out of his attempt to rape this white woman. So it's a defense of white womanhood according to this. And here it is, intermarriage of blacks and whites is required by law now uh, according, to, according to this. But this is so, uh, anyway, there are other clips here you can, you can look at if you want sometime. Uh, on the, um, there's the Stevens again. But the point is, you know, Birth of a Nation had a tremendous impact. It was widely shown, um, and uh, it, uh, it, it also became part of an interesting court case in that, um, well, I should go back and just stop, well, a little stop in a second. <laughs> um, the, this, the music is still going from there. Um, some localities banned Birth of a Nation. Some towns in the north banned it from Egypt because after it was shown in some places there were riots, there were lynchings. It's an interesting free speech issue. Is it, is it legitimate to ban a movie if it's going to inspire people to lynch other people? This went all the way to the Supreme Court and the court at that time ruled, no problem. Movies are not speech. Movies are a business and towns, cities can regulate them just like any other business. It was only after World War II that the courts applied First Amendment protections to, the, to motion pictures. So Birth of a Nation, but nonetheless, the NAACP wanted to, tried to put forward an alternative film called uh, Birth of a Race, I think. And in fact, the script of it is in the archives at UCLA, but they never got enough money to actually produce it. So, um, but the point, my point is the fundamental underpinning of this interpretation was that black people were inherently unfit to share in any kind of political power or civil equality. As Burgess, our professor here at Columbia, and a founder of the discipline of political science in the United States wrote, quote, a black skin means membership in a race of men which has never succeeded in subjecting passion to reason and has never created any civilization of any kind. And it's hard to remember, but that kind of deep racism was fundamental to American social science until World War II. Race was a building block of sociology, of history, of political science. Uh, racial inequality was just assumed throughout the world. And it was only in World War II and after that that really comes to be significantly challenged. Uh, partly we'll give a good point to Columbia by Franz Boas over in our uh, anthropology department here. 